I'm Paul, I'm Paul Kirtley, I'm doing this talk, so if you think you should be listening to somebody else, you're in the wrong place. I'll tell you who I am in a second if you don't know who I am, but show of hands, who has no idea who I am? Be honest. Good, tough audience, excellent, love it, love it. Good. So my name is Paul Kirtley, and I'm going to talk about the value of practicing wilderness skills closer to home. We talk about wilderness skills a lot, but we're not in the wilderness today, but there's lots of great skills going on here. And a lot of the UK isn't really wilderness, and yet we can get a lot of value from practicing some of the skills that we're going to, uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background about me, some of you may know me from my blog, from paulkirtley.co.uk. Some of you may know me from my YouTube channel. Please don't hold that against me. I'm not just a YouTuber. I do actually go outside and do some things. That's no disrespect to YouTubers, but there are a few people on YouTube like that. On YouTube like that. Um, it's going to stay behind the speakers there. Um, I'm a UK mountain leader. I'm also a canoe leader, four-star canoe leader, working towards five-star. So I do have some proper outdoor qualifications, but my main focus is teaching bushcraft, and I do that through my company, Frontier Bushcraft which I established back in 2010. Where I came from, yes, that is really me. A long time ago, 23 years ago, I was a bit of a racing snake then. I used to do a lot of mountain biking. All my muscle was in my legs back then, but that was me walking the West Highland Way back in 1993. And I did have a green rucksack even back then. Look. Um, worked with Ray Mears for quite a number of years. Worked with him full time for five years as course director before moving on to do Frontier Bushcraft, worked with Lars Falt up in the Arctic, worked with Gordon Hillman, worked with David Scott Donnellan, still do work with David Scott Donnellan who was here with me a couple of years ago, and Ray Goodwin as well, who many of you will know or know of, and Ray and I still work together, we take people, uh, we do stuff in the UK, but we also take small groups on wilderness trips far into the wilderness in Canada, and that's one of our groups. Um, float plane in on some of the trips which is fantastic so real real wilderness right out there when that float plane goes you're on your own probably an hour's flight from the nearest roadhead which is still in, a, in and of itself a long way away from anywhere really in terms of civilization I've also learned a lot on my travels both from indigenous peoples as well as people that I've worked with always people know things that you don't you can always learn something from somebody else um, also experience, yeah, this is the UK, this is up in Scotland, river crossing on a trip we did a couple of years ago. This is the sort of thing I do on my holidays, okay, this, this is Scotland, this is Canada, and then Bar Barris Amanda who sat there, she's in the bow on that photograph. Hiking in the autumn in Sweden just as it's turning to winter, out in all the seasons ski touring in Norway. This is the sort of thing that I like to do, often in very wild places. Winter camping up in the far north of Sweden. So that's where I'm coming from in terms of my, my background, in terms of outdoor skills, outdoor education. It's what I do full time. And what I want to talk about today, as I say, is this is in the Lake District, but applying a lot of those skills. So what value can we get from applying a lot of wilderness skills that have proven themselves in the wilderness what value can we get from using them here? And also, what are some of those skills? What do I suggest that you should be focusing on and working on? So, the value. I had a bit of a brainstorm, and I came up with a little list. And I don't know if you can see that, but basically, sense of achievement, appreciation, flexibility, discipline, realism, becoming a maker, field-tested skill set, confidence, internal development, environmental connection, freedom, self-reliance, well-being, and of course, fun. That we should be having fun if we can. Okay, so some of those will not make sense, some of them will. Well-being, just being in green spaces is good for you. Yep, don't have to do anything when you get there. Just looking at pictures of green spaces has shown to make people feel less stressed, more uh, comfortable, less aggressive. Okay, and here's a quote from a report, and if you can't see that, the balance of evidence indicates conclusively that knowing and experiencing nature makes us generally happier, healthier people. Yep. 
And I think we all know that, or many of us know that in our, in our hearts, but there are, there's an increasing amount of research going into the benefits, and Sarita also talked about some of the, the mental health benefits of practicing bushcraft before. Okay, once you start actually applying some of the skills, you start getting an environmental connection. And I think that's something that a lot of people that are drawn to bushcraft crave. They, they sit in a cubicle all week, um, maybe they're in the scouts when they were younger, and then they've gone to university, they've got a job, they've got kids, and then once they've got their kids, they think, we should be doing things outside. I used to do things outside when I was a kid, and I've lost touch with that side of my personality, and so people want a reconnection with nature, and you do get that through practicing bushcraft. And I'll use the humble birch tree as, a, as an example here. A lot of people consider birch as a weed, certainly one of the first things if you've got an an old railway siding or an old car park or something that's overgrown, you get things like buddleia and birch and these pioneer species going in and taking over. And a lot of forestry um, workers and forestry managers, up until relatively recently, considered birch, silver birch, a bit of a weed. But it is common, it is widespread, but it's also extremely useful. We all know probably that birch bark is a fantastic natural fire lighter and probably one of the best. The twigs, the dead twigs, very, very good kindling, full of oils as well in the bark, but also just really fine, matchstick thin twigs, really, really good. The leaves have got natural soap in them, they've got saponins in them, which can be used for hygiene out in the bush. The better quality bark can be used for craft work, whether you're just making a candle holder through to weaving baskets, and people have even made shoes and boots from birch bark. Carving as well, it's not necessarily the best carving wood in the world, but it's relatively easy and there's also a real tradition of carving implements out of birch in the north of uh, Scandinavia in particular, where it's one of the few broadleaf trees available. Tapping the birch for sap in the spring, we're a bit past the stage for doing that this year, but that's something that a lot of people look forward to. And then there's also a relationship between lots of trees and particular fungi, but in the case of in the case of birch, we've got the, the orange birch bolete, birch polypore, which often referred to as a razor strop fungus, so it was traditionally used for, for stropping cutthroat razors, and of course horse's hoof, Firmus fomentarius, one of the classic tinder fungi, and it's that trammer layer, that orange chamois leather-like layer in the middle, which is the really good bit for, for making amadou. And once that's lit, it burns very, very well. So there's a lot of useful elements relating to just one tree species. And so the next time you look at a green space and enjoy being in that green space, but you see some birch, then perhaps you see that differently. And certainly as you become more familiar with the bushcraft skills related to particular species, you do start seeing resources, you start seeing friends out there in what would otherwise be just a bunch of trees. Sense of achievement, okay? This is a bit of a, a cliche of bushcraft now. Pretty much any bushcraft school worth its salt has a photograph like this on it, somewhere on the homepage. And it is a great sense of achievement. Every time you, you get a, an ember, you get fire by friction, you do have a really good sense of achievement. Not just the first time, as, as in the case of the student here. Every time I achieve it, it's a good feeling. You have a sense of achievement. And it's not just the guys, it's not just the guy thing. The girls really enjoy getting that ember as well. And groups, it's a great group activity, getting people working together and lots of smiles when they achieve that flame. Realism. I'll use bow drill as an example again. There's a big difference between doing bow drill on a nice warm May bank holiday weekend like today and doing it on a cold, wet, windy, damp, April day, um, like here, and particularly when you're demonstrating it in front of students. But the point is, the more you practice this, you practice this technique with different materials, different natural materials, clearly go to the woods, collect the materials that you need there and then, and make a set, make fire, and the more conditions you do it in, the more realistic your abilities become, and the better sense of realism that you have about the skill set. So by practicing these wilderness skills, actually if you look closely at that photograph, 
there's actually a cottage not far behind. So we're not in the middle of the wilderness. We are in the woods. We are on the edge of a, of a big estate, but there's a cottage there. We're not a million miles away from anywhere, but still practicing these skills in a realistic way where you go to the forest and make the set gives you a sense of realism about the skills. Also, flip side. If you're practicing skills that you know have proven over the test, they've stood the test of time, they've proven themselves in wilderness. So this is a, a photo, quite a wide angle shot, it's a bit of an odd shot, but of um, a little promontory where we had our camp on one of our wilderness trips in Canada. And it's a nice day, it's a beautiful evening, still water there, but we're traveling all day, we're paddling all day, we get to camp, we have to unload the boats, we have to set up camp, we have to set up our personal areas, mutual group area, fire, we have to get firewood, we have to process it, and we have to cook, and we need to do that in a reasonable time, get to bed and have a rest, um, because we need to paddle again the next day, it's a two week paddling trip. So we need to be efficient with our skills, and we need to efficiently get those things to work, our tarp knots, our water purification, our cooking, our fire lighting, we need to do all of those things efficiently, even if it's pouring with rain. We can't just have a night off because the weather's bad. So the skills that prove themselves in the wilderness, in, and in terms of the way that you actually do them, in terms of realistic timings, you can bring back to the UK. So if you're, even if you're never going to a wilderness, if you're watching people who do, and you're learning from people who do, who've been there, as, as many of us who teach have, then you know that you're practicing the right skills in the right way because they work under the circumstances of duress or pressure or efficiency. So whenever I post a photograph like this on Facebook, I get people saying, that's irresponsible, that flame's too big, you don't need that much kindling, etc., etc., etc. The problem is, the guys are all wearing t-shirts, it's a nice warm, dry day. I don't know where any of those students are going. It's Henry, one of my assistants there, doing the demonstration. I don't know where any of those students are going next. Okay, they might be on a one-day course with us or a two-day course with us, but I regularly get emails from people telling me where they've applied the skills that they've learned from us. So, uh, for example, somebody wrote to me a little while ago and said, oh, I've just done a canoe trip in a wilderness area in New York State, uh, up near Maine, and it was wet, it was cold, and I was the only one in the group who could consistently light a fire. And that's having done a one-day course where we've shown them how to do this. Similarly, a guy who did a hiking trip in Sweden, group were pretty bad at lighting fires. He could light the fires and taught everybody else how to do it during the trip. So these things work. If you practice for just fine weather, if you practice for conditions that are not particularly difficult, when you actually get to somewhere where you really need to rely on them, they don't work so well. So we always teach people on the basis that even though we're maybe teaching them in a bluebell wood in Sussex, they might be in a wilderness area the next week or in six months time or a year's time. You don't know. So you have to teach them properly. And then when we do have a really wet day, the students don't necessarily like it watching a demonstration bedraggled in the rain, but the same techniques, even though you don't get the high flames, gets the fire going, even in the pouring rain. And that's what we're aiming to teach people. Internal development. Well, this is me 10 years ago, almost to the day. This is July 2006, when I got my black belt in a particular style of jiu-jitsu. And those are some of my training buddies who also got their black belts at the same time. And for me, having studied martial arts for a long time, but also studied bushcraft for a long time, I can see there's a similarity in terms of what it does to you inside, in terms of your approach, your mentality, your acceptance of things the way that they are. You don't get upset and angry and throw your toys out of the pram when they aren't the way you want them to be. You go with the flow and you use your skill to work to your advantage. And so I'll use bow drill as another example. The ability to go to the woods select some material that's of the right type, find it however long that takes, make a bow drill set, get it to work, make an ember, make sure that ember survives and blow it into flame. To me, it epitomizes bushcraft in a lot of ways, or it's certainly iconic of bushcraft, but it also develops these internal things, patience, uh, attention to detail, working with what you've got rather than wishing they were the way that they are. And that brings a certain discipline. And we don't need to be a million miles away either for this. We can be doing this in our back garden, in our local woods. 
We can also overlay some extra discipline by, for example here, always burning your Bodil set. If you're practicing, rather than saying, oh, this is a really good set, I'll keep it, I'll put it in the garage yeah, and dry it out. Because it'll work better next time. But that's making you not so good at bow drill as you would be if you went out and made another set each time. If you're really trying to get better at these skills, develop these skills, put some imposed positive constraints on it. Burn your set, make another one. Try a different material next time. Becoming a maker. Lots of people these days in their day-to-day -day lives never make anything. Their jobs involve computers, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with computers, we're using one now for giving this presentation. Yep. But people use computers, they're working in offices, their job really involves passing information on to other people, moving information around, um, selling, customer service, all of these things don't involve doing things physically with your hands. But as soon as you get involved in bushcraft, you can select some nice material, some nice cherry here, for example, a few tools, and you can make some really, really nice things. And that's very satisfying in itself, but you're also practicing hand-eye coordination. You're making things, which is not so common these days. And this is a set that I made for a Frost River canvas roll so that we then had a nice set of utensils for one of our canoe trips, for example. Also, there's a nice thing about going into the woods and making something almost from nothing. So here's a, a bark container, a bark basket, if you like, made from sweet chestnut bark, lashed together with some roots. It's made on one of our intermediate courses. And it's nice to be able to go into the woods, find the materials and make something which is aesthetically pleasing, but also the process of making is nice to do. Yeah, it it's involves you and your senses and your hands and your eyes in a way that we often don't do in other parts of our lives these days. And the ultimate extension of those sorts of skills are things like birch bark canoes. Going into the woods, finding all the materials that you need, whether it be pine tar, whether it be spruce roots, whether it be cedar, whether it be birch bark, it's all found in the forest. And there's a quote that I really like from this master birch bark boat builder. And, and for those of you that can't quite see that, so this is Marcel Labelle and he says, people ask me, where did you get this canoe? And I say, well, I found it in the bush. Some assembly required. And that to me in a lot of ways epitomizes this real sense of connection with the bush, with nature, that you get from understanding how to use the materials. And you don't have to build a birch bark canoe. Okay? Even just understanding how to source and find and process and prepare a spruce root. And this was a, a situation where we were on one of our Canadian canoe trips. And some of you might have read this story on my blog. But basically, um, there were six of us. And these days, on a single prop uh, beaver plane, you can only take one tandem canoe on the outside. So there were six of us three tandem boats on the river, that meant three plane trips to get us into where we needed to, and it's about a 45 minute flight in. But the morning that we were flying in, we were supposed to be flying in at 8.30, one of the planes had developed a fault, so there were only two planes available. And uh, so that meant one of them had to go back and get the remaining people or remaining kit or whatever it was. So what we'd normally do is we'd do two people in each boat with their kit and some group kit, two people in each plane, sorry, with a boat on the outside, with a kit, and then we'd all get there in three flights. But what we did here was I went with one of the, the clients, the other three clients went in the second plane, and then Ray uh, Goodwin was going to come up in the last plane with the rest of the group kit. What happened though was the weather deteriorated. So we ended up, five of us in the woods, 45 minute float plane flight from the roadhead, which was also quite remote, and Ray couldn't get in. Now Ray had the dry food and he had the cooking equipment. We had the fresh food and not a lot else other than our personal kit. Um, we had some brew kit, but that was about it. All, most of the dried food was with Ray, the cooking equipment was with Ray, and so we just made the things that we needed. It wasn't a hassle. We needed to cook bacon, so we made a griddle. We didn't have a frying pan, it was fine. 
And that's the sort of attitude. It doesn't have to be a survival situation. It's just, oh, we don't have what we need. We'll just make it. And that's what we did. One of the guys didn't have all of his personal kit with him because some of it was with the group kit. We just made do and we lent him things. And that, that spirit of just, okay, what do we need to do? What can we make? And it was calm. It was fine. The weather was bad, as I say. That's why the plane didn't come in. But it wasn't a big deal. Ray came in the next day and we carried on the trip. So you don't have to be building birch bark canoes for these things to be useful. And it builds confidence, that sort of experience where you're not flustered by things, you just make what you need, you, you adapt, you improvise, it builds confidence. And the ability to go into the woods, even here in this example, this is in northern Sweden, where you can build a shelter, you can light a fire, make a long log fire, and survive a night at minus 30 in comfort. Um, is a real confidence builder and that's the sort of confidence that these skills give you. Freedom. I think we probably all understand this. Going to the woods with a basic kit, setting a tarp up, lighting a fire, spending the night, even local woods, gives us a sense of freedom that maybe we don't have otherwise and it's really, really important. Appreciation. And by that I mean when I've had clients or students in the woods for a week they say I'm looking forward to a shower. I'm looking forward to the fact that I don't have to use a head torch, I can turn the lights on at home. That there's going to be running water, I don't need to filter it or put it through a millbank bag and boil it. Yeah? We appreciate the smaller things. It doesn't mean to say that we disown the things in the woods that we like doing, but we just appreciate the, the, uh, the luxuries of home maybe a little bit more than, than many people do. Self-reliance. Of course, if the zombie apocalypse arrives, we're probably going to be all right. So for me, bushcraft really is at the core, it's, a, it's about a study of nature. Yeah? We've talked a lot about using natural materials. And there's a knowledge required there, there's also some skills required there, and as a whole I would refer to all of that as knowledge and skills as skills, because they're really intertwined, and also experience. Yeah, the more experienced you are with using these things and applying them in different situations, the better you will be. So what skills? Well, I kind of did a bit of a brainstorm with a mind map and just the basic skills, and I came up with this. And you can't see that. I appreciate that. But if you go to my blog, and it's not up yet, it'll be up tomorrow night once the show's finished, and type in that web address, skills-list, you will get a list of, of what I listed there. It's what I think are a, a good broad range of basic skills for a bushcraft person to have. Fire is clearly going to be close to the top of that. And you'll notice here that I've been on a bit of a quest to try and photograph fires at night looking something like an old Dutch master oil painting. Yeah, it's just a little bit of a, a hobby of mine. Yeah, but whether it was in Sussex as the previous photograph, Windermere, in the Lake District here, out in the middle of nowhere in the boreal forest of Manitoba is in this situation here, or in the high north, high arctic forest in northern Sweden with a long log fire. There's a commonality there, the, the power and the value of fire, um, particularly at night, um, in terms of warmth, in terms of all the other things that we need to do, in terms of camaraderie, in terms of morale. And when you're looking at your fire skills, don't be complacent. Go right back. Just as in martial arts, it's the, mo it's the basics which are the most important. The same with your fire lighting. Go back and make sure that you're practicing things in the right way, that you're ingraining good habits. Are you always striking a match, match in the optimal way that's going to minimize the chance of you breaking the, uh, the matchstick? Are you getting the biggest, most concentrated sparks from your fire steel? There are two, for me, two main ways of taking a flame to an established fire. One is small sticks, the classic small stick fire. Birch twigs we already talked about, spruce twigs, pine. Those small sticks that burn very well, we can put in bundles like witch's broom, broom sticks. That's a key way and it works in a lot of places. The other one is feather sticks. If you can't get the, the, the fine kindling because it's too wet or it's just not available, you can split down wood and you can shave it with your knife and you can light it with a match. You can produce all the different kindling and small fuel that you need from a round of dead standing wood, as long as you've got a knife and as long as you've got the skill. And by a good feather stick, we're talking about that sort of thing. Not the rubbishy fuzz sticks that you see in a lot of old survival books. A good feather stick should have long curls. It should have a thin neck that will light from the curls so that you've got your second layer of fuel there 
already. And that should be connected to the stem, not all disparate on the floor, so that you can manipulate that and get your fire going with ease. That requires some skill with your knife, but given we're all bushcraft people, most people like knives, so it's a good excuse to be using your knife a lot, and it's also a good excuse for you to have it nice and sharp, which, again, bushcraft people like doing. They like spending time sharpening their knives. So, feather sticks is the perfect thing to be practicing even in the back garden, whether it's for lighting your barbecue, lighting your wood-burning stove, whatever the opportunity you have, practice feather sticks and get good at making nice long curls. You can start experimenting with fibrous plant materials as well. This is honeysuckle on its way to being buffed up to blow an ember into flame. It's not quite there yet, but you can experiment with fibrous plant materials. You can experiment with downy seed heads, really instrumental in catching sparks. And then you can play around with combinations. So here's one. I only had a tiny, this is a bit of a survival experiment I was doing on my own, and I only had one of those little old fashioned military spark. It's not a modern ferro rod, not a modern fire steel, just the old um, hacksaw blade and a little sparker. And bracken, as it is, doesn't tend to take sparks very well anyway. But what I've put at the bottom there is a bit of um, cattail, uh, greater reed mace, tifa latifolia, a bit of seed head, which will catch the spark very well, but will go up very quickly. Then I've got some bracken laid up in a nice little V fire lay, and then I've got my birch twigs on top. So it's that combination, catching the spark, catching the flame into a bigger flame and then getting the kindling going. And that then, with one spark, gets the fire going. So it's that knowledge of natural materials again. And lots of people will argue, well, I always carry a ferro rod, I always carry a lighter, I always carry matches, I don't need to practice all of these things. You do, if you want to be good at them. That's, it depends whether you want to be good at them or not. At the end of the day, nobody's saying you have to be. At the end of the day, we don't need to be any good at any of these skills most of the time in our daily lives. We choose to practice at them. So if, if you take away anything from this today, is all I'm saying is choose to be good at them, if you're going to choose to do them at all. And of course, make sure you know how to clear up a fire afterwards and leave it with as little trace as possible. You, a lot of people ask me about shelters. Some of you know that I do a Q&A show on YouTube. Some of you um, ask me questions on Twitter and just generally ask me questions. And a lot of people ask me about shelters. Um, go to town with shelters if you want to, but a lot of the time, certainly on wilderness trips, you're not going to be building shelters. And if you're in a survival situation, I, I can't think of many survival situations in the UK where you're going to have to build a leaf shelter because if you've got the energy and the physical capacity to build something like that, you can probably walk to the nearest road, frankly. Um, but it's a great thing to do. It's a lot of fun to do. And in more extreme environments, it could be a very useful skill. Um, but if you're going to do it, do it well. When I was a kid, we used to build dens. Yeah, I think it's almost an innate thing that we can all do. Yeah, we can go to the woods as kids and we can make a den. We can put some branches up against a tree trunk. Um, forest schools do it a lot with kids. And kids just know how to do it. They can kind of make a little thing to crawl into. Um, as adults, we should be aiming to be a little bit better than that. Um, so make a well-thatched shelter that's going to keep the rain out. It's going to keep the wind out. Make a bed that you can actually sleep on. Don't make a hovel that will be unpleasant to spend a couple of hours in. Make a shelter that will be pleasant to spend a few days in. But also, I would encourage you to get good at your knots, all of your tarp knots, because frankly, that's what you're going to be using a lot of the time, whether you're sleeping on the ground, whether you like hanging from a tree in a, in a hammock, you're going to need to be good at your knots. So practice them. Practice them so that you can do them in the dark. When you arrive at a campsite and it's late and it's windy and rainy, you can get set up quickly and get under cover. So practice all of these knots for big tarps and for small tarps so that you can do that without thinking about it. Also, make sure that you understand how to get the most out of your sleeping equipment. Again, I get lots of questions about condensation buildup in bivy bags, sleeping bags not working properly. Understand how to use the baffles. Understand how to air things out. Understand how to make the most of all your sleeping kit. And understand about the dangers of being out. If you're going to be camping out year round, understand about hypothermia. Understand about how heat loss um, can go into the environment, different ways that you can lose heat to the environment and make sure that you've got things in place to minimize that. Water and heat and hydration, so you need to understand hyperthermia, you need to understand uh, dehydration. I'm sure some of you, some of you have been at the beer tent already, um, 
Uh, some of you have been out in the sun, some of you will be dehydrated already and here it doesn't really matter but as soon as you start working harder it matters more. Say you were building a natural shelter, so understand about water, understand what the problems are with water, what can make you ill, understand how to deal with it and that could simply just be boiling or it could be one of the many really good filtration systems which are available on the market these days and also if you're camping with other people, spoons, if you're camping with other people then make sure you've got a system in place so that everybody knows where the clean water is, everybody knows where the dirty water is, and there's a system um, in place. I was speaking to somebody recently who um, got very ill due to getting a waterborne disease, and it transpired they'd been treating their water very well, they'd been using a Milbank bag, they'd been boiling, or they'd been doing other things with it to treat it, but then they'd been washing up in dirty water. And so their cup and their mug, uh, so their mug and their plate was contaminated and that's how probably how they got ill. So think about what you're doing, understand pathogenic organisms, understand how you can get ill when you're camping and make sure and that doesn't have to be a million miles away. You then come on to some of your basic campcraft. How do we efficiently boil water over a, a fire? To more elaborate setups. So again it comes back to your knife use, your craft work, making things. It all starts to tie together. And there are lots of different ways of hanging a pot over a fire and that's fun to play with and again you can be almost in your back garden to do that and again it develops knife skills and it's a nice thing to do. Cooking, yeah, we all need to eat um, probably several times a day and cooking is a great thing to do outdoors, it's very satisfying. If you can cook some good meals you'll really impress your friends as well. Yeah. It's a really good way to, way to get free beers if you can cook a good stew or cook a good bannock or cook good pancakes, that's a, that's a skill worth having. Probably it's up there, it should have been just below fire I reckon. Okay? Cooking is really, really important and you can become more elaborate. If you want to panace a fish, you don't have to be fly fishing in Alaska. You don't have to be out in the middle of nowhere. You can go to your local fishmonger, buy a whole salmon and practice the technique how to fillet the fish and cook it over the fire. You can do that, you can do it at the barbecue. If you know a friendly gamekeeper, you might be even able to get hold of something a bit bigger and practice um, larger game butchery. And there's a, there was a good demonstration going on out there earlier on. Um, cooking over the fire in simple ways can be very, very nice. Again, these can all be practiced. You can practice these things with families. You can do it on, on campsites that allow fires. You can do it um, almost over a barbecue if you want. And, learn how these, this, this looks simple, but the number of people I've seen try and rush this style of cooking of a fish over a fire on a stick and end up with a fish in the fire or burning through the stick or whatever it is, um, takes a little bit of subtlety. It's worth practicing. Of course, there's lots of other methods of cooking. When we come on to finding food, people ask about trapping. Now, most trapping these days is not legal. And there's very few methods of trapping in the UK which are legal and often there for specific purposes. And when it comes to making traps from natural materials, they're pretty much all illegal. And that's certainly not just the case in the UK. In relatively wild places, you'll also find that's the case. You need It's quite closely, even in places like Canada where fur, people still trap for furs, the way that that's done is quite closely regulated. You can't just go and chuck whatever you want in the woods. But there's, a, there's an interest here. There's a, the, I, I used to like taking my bike apart when I was kids. I took my Star Wars ATAT to bits when I was young and I never put it back together again. I like knowing how things work. And it's the same with traps. An understanding of the trigger mechanisms and the mechanics, it's an interesting and stimulating thing to learn how to do even if you never employ it in practice. And of course tracking. This is really, really interesting to me. Um, I'm really passionate about tracking because to me it's a way of seeing the world for what it really is. Um, there are a few key elements of bushcraft in terms of understanding the natural world and for me tracking is one. It's, it's like learning to read. Um, until you can learn to track, until you can learn to identify and locate and follow sign or spur, however you want to call it, you can't really read what's been going on. It's really like learning to read. So understanding what you're seeing and that comes with time. It's not something that's going to come overnight. So you can chip away at it bit by bit by bit. Go out regularly in your local area and see what you can see through the year. What tracks can you see if there's snow on the ground? When it's been raining, what's fresh? What's got raindrops in it so that it was older? What's fresh that's on the fresh mud in the puddles? 
you really start, it will be, it'll infuriate your partners. If you've got a partner, a wife, or a girlfriend, or a husband, or a boyfriend who isn't interested in bushcraft, this will infuriate the hell out of them, you getting interested in tracks and sign, because your walks will become very, very slow. Yeah, we've got some droppings there with beetles and fur and things in there, some fox droppings. It's interesting to see what you can see. Also, foraging, tree and plant identification. For me, if you can't walk into the woods in, the, in, in your local area and tell me what every single tree and plant is in that local area, you've got work to do as far as I'm concerned. And that's the, that's the internal talk that I have with myself. Yeah, I get, I get irritated, not irritated isn't the right word, but I, I, I get motivated, probably a better word, to find out what something is if I don't know what it is. Yeah, and you should be the same. You should have that I inquisitiveness about nature. And in terms of foraging for food, there's leaves, there's flowers, there's berries, there's roots, there's rhizomes, pollen. A lot of people don't even think about pollen as being a food source. Medicinal herbs, yarrow here, for example, is a classic one. As and that's before we get onto edible fungi, which a lot of people think it's not worth bothering with, and maybe from a survival perspective, for short-term survival, it isn't. In terms of flavor, um, unless you dislike mushrooms at all, then it's worth learning some basic fungi, such as some of the boletus, so there's birch bolete there, um, there's, there's uh, chanterelles there as well. There are some that are easy to recognize that add a lot of flavor, and they're worth learning. Also, so I talked about looking at nature's signs, really looking in detail, foraging, learning all the trees and plants, or just learning to identify them, even if you're not interested in wild foods, just learn to identify them. Because until you learn the resources, how to identify them, you can't really get beyond that until you can tell the difference between a birch and a willow and a beech and an oak and a spruce and all these other trees which are all out there. Um, you can't use them to their maximum capacity in terms of using the spruce roots, using the birch twigs, using the willow wands, using the barks of different trees. You can't do that until you can identify them. And then when you become more granular in looking at some of the plants, it's exactly the same. The other element, the third element really, is looking at what the environment's telling you about direction. Yeah. There's been two unfortunate cases just in the news in the past couple of days where people have been um, found dead in the wilderness after quite a long time. And one of them is almost certainly down to the fact that somebody got completely disoriented and couldn't find their way out of a relatively straightforward situation. The more you can glean from your environment about the direction that you're facing and the direction that you need to go, the better. Um, every single day, the sun passes once through the sky as we rotate once. Every single day, you've got a data point for looking at where does the sun rise? Where does it set? When is it at its highest point? What time is local noon where I am? What angle is it at? And through the seasons, how do those things change? You can observe that every single day, wherever you are. You don't need to be out in the wilderness. And it's one of the most regular ways of learning natural navigation. And the same with the moon. Yeah, the moon can tell you a lot about direction. Um, it was a long time before mathematicians worked out equations for the, the motion of the moon. And Newton had a lot to do with that, with his laws of uh, motion. Um, it's quite complicated. But if you remember the fact that the moon is illuminated by the sun and you understand the movement of the sun, that's very, very helpful. And again, you've got data points every single day. You don't need to be out in the wilds. Yeah, even in town, this photograph was taken in London. Yeah, even in town, when there's a lot of light pollution, you will still see the moon if it's up. And a new crescent moon can tell you a lot about the direction of the sun. It can tell you where south is. There's lots of things that you can glean just from looking at the moon and the sun before you even start looking at the stars and other factors. So learn these things. You've got an opportunity every day to, to, to learn about these things. And also learn how to use a map and compass. Yeah, let's not be romantic. They're really, really good tools. And also learning about reading a map will also tell you more about reading the landscape understanding where water sources are, understanding where different resources are. You can glean a lot from a map. You're going to need some tools. I haven't really talked about sharp, shiny things yet, but you will need some tools for doing some of the skills we talked about. But I would caution against going over the top. That's pretty much all I think you need as a beginner, or even an intermediate in terms of, really, you know, if we're honest, in terms of practicing bushcraft skills, you need a, a knife, a saw, and 
and the fire steel is going to get you a long way with your, with your fire lighting skills in terms of practicing different um, techniques and different materials, you may well need a sharpening stone as well at some point, of course, and learn how to sharpen your knife and turn, learn how to look after it and learn how to do that with a cheap one before you buy an expensive one. Or at least if, practice with a cheap one even if you've already got an expensive one. And also learn the limitations. Yeah? Um, the more you use things, the more you will learn the limitations. And I have regular arguments about whether mores break. Mores do break sometimes, but it's normally when they're being batoned. And if we're not very far away from home, we can take a spare or we can just go to the shop and get a new one. When we're in a wilderness, maybe we need to take something more robust. Because I do see a few percent or maybe one percent of these break when battening every year. That's just the fact of the matter. So then choose something that's more robust as appropriate. Yeah. But that comes with experience. And then when you do find something that suits you really well, use it lots and lots and lots. You can see how well used and well traveled that stuff is. That's my personal knife and saw and fire steel when I took that photograph for an article. Yeah. You can see from the sheaths, they have not been in a drawer. They have not just come out of the shop. They have traveled. They've been to Canada, they've been to Sweden, they've been to Africa, they've been to lots of places and they've been used. And you will learn to use lots of different tools over time and that's great, going back to being a maker and being um, au fait with how, and you can do a lot with a few tools. We've got a folding book saw there, we've got an axe, small forest axe, they're ubiquitous, a really good portable axe. We've got an adze there which some of you will be familiar with, maybe some people aren't, but that's good for make, hollowing out larger things. You've got your bushcraft knife, you've got a carving knife, and then maybe a backup folder for your pocket. And learn how to use these things really, really well. That's, again, at the core of the craft side of bushcraft. And you should look at something like this and just see a bunch of resources there. Yeah? Um, the, the willow ones, the bark, there's birch in the background, there's bracken. There's all sorts in this photograph once you start looking. There's a world of resources out there and you will recognize them as such the more experience you have and the more skill that you have. You can turn things into cordage or at least start to process bark for cordage and turn out nice useful cordage which surprises a lot of people. There's so many useful things out there. I know a lot of you are familiar with these sorts of things but you'd be surprised. Everybody's at different levels with their learning. Some people some people have got no idea that this event is going on this weekend and yet they might be interested in, in seeing these things. So again, spread the word if you can about how you can do these things. Now I think this is too small for the screen, okay? But it's, I'm really cautioning you to keep things simple, both with your kit and with the way that you apply the bushcraft skills. There's lots of people who are always, I think it's a, I think it's a tendency of our of our age that we're always trying to find a better way, version 2.0 of doing something. Yep. But this is from a long time ago. This is a quote from Thomas Aquinas. And if you don't know who he is or was, um, you can Google him. But he said some quite sensible things, even though it was a long time ago. And what he says here is, if a thing can be done adequately by means of one, it is superfluous to do it by means of several. For we observe that nature does not employ two instruments where one suffices. And I like that because at the core of that is keep things simple. Yeah, keep things straightforward. There's a beauty and an aesthetic to keeping things simple. And I think if you apply bushcraft properly and in a way that's in tune with nature, as Thomas Aquinas suggests here, it's, he came to this conclusion from observing nature, then we can do the same. We can keep things simple. Now, I'm not going to be romantic either. Um, be sensible with your skill set. Learn the basic skills you need to look after. If you're going out into the outdoors, and again, I don't mean to be patronizing here, but we see cases in the news, and the Sun, and the da Daily Mirror, and the Guardian, and the Telegraph, and all the other newspapers love stories of people getting lost. Um, Discovery Channel have made a, made a fortune out of uh, people in adversity, whether it's contrived or whether it's real. We like these stories and the papers like these stories, but I don't want any students of mine or anybody I ever speak to to be in difficult situations. Learn how to look after yourself. Learn, um, stop and plan. Learn how to protect yourself from the environment. Learn how to signal. Learn how to find water, make shelter, all of those things. Because otherwise, you don't want to be recipients of, of one of these. Carry a survival bag if you're in the hills. 
Yeah, that's much more important to carry in the hills than a bushcraft knife in the UK. Um, make, be sensible about where you're going. Don't be romantic about the skills. Yeah, uh, survival fishing kit is not very much use to you on Scarfell Pike. Yeah, a, a, a blizzard bag is much more useful to you. So I would, just to re-emphasize, in terms of skills, we talk, I, remember I, I was quite careful in how I titled this. I didn't say bushcraft skills at the beginning, I said wilderness skills. Um, and a lot of, for me, a lot of wilderness skills, a lot of what's in there is bushcraft. But as a baseline, I also think you should learn to navigate well. Um, and there's a pleasure in, a lot of people get stressed about navigation. A lot of people get stressed about angles and numbers because they had bad maths teachers at school. I think that's a lot of it. So we can blame them, but get over that. Um, if you're not very good at navigating, if you don't understand how to use a map and a compass together, learn how to do that. Find somebody who knows how to do that, that can show you to do that. Because that's going to open up a lot of semi-wild places in the UK to you that maybe would otherwise not be available to you. So it allows you to get into places that you can't otherwise get into. And it also helps keep you out of trouble. It means that maybe you don't have to spend the night in the hills. Maybe you can find your way back to the car or the pub or wherever it is. It's an important thing. And also get some good first aid training. Yeah, I see a lot of people get very excited about fires and axes and knives and many fewer people do good first aid training. Get some realistic training where somebody's providing good scenarios with lots of blood and gore and it looks real because then when you do have to have a real situation whether it's something to do with what you're doing outdoors or if you're just traveling home after a weekend meeting your bushcraft mates in the woods and the, you come across a crash on the road you're going to be a better human being in, in terms of being able to deal with that and help somebody else that needs it. So please do get some, I think that's a basic wilderness skill as well. And as I say, that skills list will be up tomorrow night. Make a note of that, paulcurtley.co.uk forward slash skills list. And a lot of what I talked about there, plus all the others that I didn't quite touch on that are in that sort of spider's web diagram will be on that list. If you want to find me online, there's lots of free information at paulkirtley.co.uk that will help you with a lot of the skills that I've talked about tonight, this afternoon. And if you want to come and learn from me personally, you can do that through my company, frontierbushcraft.com. Okay, and that's me at half past. Can we have a couple of minutes for questions? Yeah, yeah cool. Has anybody got any questions? Yes. What's my favorite country to travel to? Um, at the moment, it's Canada. It really is, because for me, I, I grew up in the UK, and as my horizons have got bigger, the landscapes that I wanted to go to have got, have got bigger, and so I, I've explored the UK a lot, I've explored Europe and Scandinavia a lot, and there's some fantastic places there, but once you get into Canada, remember that photo I showed at the beginning was sort of flying over the forest, and you, fly, you take off off a lake, and you fly over the forest and you just look down and it's just mile after mile after mile after mile of trees. It, it just blows your mind and to land in the middle of that wilderness and then to explore that wilderness, even though people have been there before, but to explore it for yourself, that for me is a real, it's a real pleasure at the moment. So for me at the moment, it, it's Canada. Yeah. Lots of cool wildlife in Canada as well. Yeah. More questions? Say that again, sorry? What inspired me to do bushcrafting? Well, when I was, how old are you? Um, 11. 11, okay. So when I was about your age, um, I lived in a small village. I'd lived in Wales for a bit when I was younger and we used to go in the forest, but then I lived in a small village in um, the north of England. And there were, there were only a couple of other lads who were the same age as me. And um, we used to go out into the woods. As you know, we used to go out, we, had, we were into BMXs and catapults and going to the woods. That's kind of what we did. And um, we just got interested in lighting fires and building shelters and these sorts of things. And um, when I was 13, my dad bought me Lofty Wiseman's survival handbook. And we started trying to do some things out of that book. And I just started to, to get interested in the survival skills. And then later on, I got more into hiking and backpacking and traveling by foot in wilder places. And then I came back to the survival skills thinking, I really should know some of those things I played around with when I was, when I was younger. I really should know how to do those things properly because I'm going to wilder places and 
Um, I, I have to rely on my stove and my tent, and I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about how to rely without those on myself without those things if I need to. So then I started looking into learning survival skills formally, and then to cut a long story short, I ended up finding Ray Mears and studied from him, and then ended up working with him, and it just went from there. So it was really an extension of an interest I'd always had, but it came full circle back to it being my job in the end. So that's, that's where it came from. Any other questions? You might have to shout quite loud. Yeah, so the question was, um, when you're in the wilderness, um, it's often advised to check streams before you drink from them in case there's a dead animal in it. So how far should you check? And um, I, I, I'm almost going to change the question in the sense that unless you can be sure that there isn't something there, you should assume there is. That, that's, that, that would be the starting point. Um, it depends on how fast it's flowing, it depends on how big it is. So, for example, my, my personal experience, if I'm in Scotland and I'm above any livestock, um, then I will drink the water straight from the streams because it's coming out of a, a peat bog, it's snow melt, it's, it's rain that's filtering through. And um, yes, check immediately above that there isn't a dead animal. Um, but, you know, if it's, if, if you, if it's nearby, you're going to smell it generally, unless the wind's blowing in the opposite direction. So check a little way, maybe 20, 30 meters, but I don't worry too much about it. Um, now, for example, look at, the, look at the landscape as well. You know, if it's just a stream coming through some moss, you know, for quite a distance, and you can look up a hillside and not see much, that, you know, why would an animal have died there is what I'm coming to. Whereas if it's like a load of crags and, and it's coming down through some rocks, there's more likely to be something that's, that's in there. So maybe pay it more attention. So uh, look at the circumstances. But generally, um, that's in the UK. If I'm in the Lake District, there's lots of people, there's lots of sheep. I just assume it's dirty, frankly. Although I know some of it probably isn't. Um, so really, the only exceptions for me would be in, in Scotland, up in, the high, up in the high ground. And... Um, once we move over to Scandinavia, you know, if we're a long way away from habitation in Sweden, for example, the water's pretty pure there. You don't have problems with things like Giardia. Whereas when you go into Canada, even in a similar sort of environment in terms of spruce and pine and sphagnum moss and bog myrtle and all those sorts of things which should be familiar from Scandinavia, you've got a, a, a beaver population which has got um, Giardia. Um, which is hosting giardia, it's putting giardia into the water, you just have to assume that the water's not safe to drink. And so my primary focus when I'm in that environment is, is, is really just filtering out the, 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 um, the cysts. And once you've done that, I don't tend to bother putting chemical treatment in for bacteria and other things, because the water's generally quite clean, other than the fact that you've got this um, giardia uh, population there in the, form, in, in the, in the beavers. So um, I think it depends where you are. Um, Frank, does that answer the question? Because, yeah, cool, cool. Um, yeah. One more question. What's your favourite season to be out? What's my favourite season to be out? Well, I like, I like, this is a, I like all seasons, but um, if we're talking about some of the, the wilder places, so we use the word bush, so some of the wilder places in the northern hemisphere, I like being out in the early spring and I like being out in the late summer, early autumn because the insects aren't as bad. Yeah? So, you know, whether we're talking about North America or whether we're talking about Scotland or whether we're talking about um, Scandinavia, you've got problems with mosquitoes, black fly, you know, midges, mosquitoes. Um, so yeah, those are some of the most pleasant times to be out. You've still got relatively long days compared to the depths of the winter, but you don't have all those bitey insects. So you can sit around the campfire and enjoy it a bit more. Um, so for me, that's, that's the favorite time for, for getting out there into really wild places in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Cool, right, well thank you very, very much. Thank you for your attention. And I guess I might see some of you in the beer tent a bit later on. So. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.